Yeah. <laughs> no animations for you. No animations. Not even slides. I think we should stand, all right? Okay, guys. It's time to start, yeah. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to uh, CCAM session. So actually, you know, um, this time the agenda is really very busy and uh, Deborah asked me, uh, asked the chairs, it's better for us to end the session uh, 10 minutes earlier and then for people to take the bus, you know, to leave more time for, for the social event. So, yeah. I will quickly go through some general information that has been, you know, repeated 100 times, maybe. Okay. Okay, load where? I think you know it very well. Skip. So, uh, please speak in front of the mic and uh, state your name before speaking. And also for the minute taker, it will be much appreciated if anyone can contribute the minutes over the, you know, uh, through the ESPAD. Yeah, okay. I, I think how many can help us at least. Session, this one. So you know, actually, uh, this time we have plenty of jobs, actually, 23 jobs, 15 slots. So the agenda is really uh, busy. And uh, actually, that's very good that CCAM is still, you know, glowing. So for the IPR process, yeah, so the contributors or, you know, co-authors, you have to, you know, reply the IPR call as soon as possible. Otherwise, it will, you know, slow down the, you know, WG process. And uh, we always encourage people to use the main list as, uh, as much as possible, especially, for example, to introduce some new topic, to discuss some uh, technologies, and also especially uh, we need to use the main list to build the, you know, WG consensus, okay? Okay, short update on the status of the working group. We have no new errata, no new RFCs since uh, uh, last meeting. Uh, this doesn't mean that we have been lazy because we have uh, two drafts uh, ready for uh, working group plus call. The APR polling is already done and we have one draft ready for uh, working group adoption polling. Uh, we have uh, uh, one draft in the editor queue and one, uh, one in uh, the ISG processing. Next please. Okay, so we have uh, uh, five uh, drafts uh, uh, on the agenda. First one uh, is the microwave framework. This is one of the two documents uh, that will be last called uh, immediately after uh, uh, the, uh, the end of the meeting. Uh, and we will have uh, uh, all the young models for uh, WSON, microwave, and uh, OTN presented today. Then uh, we have uh, the uh, framework for uh, uh, WDM uh, interface manage management uh, and control, which uh, is the second draft uh, that will be last called uh, after the meeting. Uh, the next uh, draft that uh, we will progress uh, is the RSVPT bandwidth availability. We will uh, launch the IPR declaration request uh, uh, after, uh, after the meeting. We have uh, uh, the transport MBI use cases, which will not be presented, but we have two use cases presented uh, uh, presented today. Um, the WSON uh, uh, impairment validation information model, which uh, uh, doesn't have major changes compared to the, the last meeting, and the OSPF availability extension, uh, which is uh, in uh, the ISG processing. No liaisons, neither incoming or outgoing, which is quite strange. And that's it. Let's start immediately and try to save as much time as we can. Unfortunately, uh, the, uh, this wonderful thing doesn't work, so you need to ask Fatai to move the slides for you.
Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Amy Yin from Huawei. So I'm going to present the two working group drafts. It's uh, both show from the microwave design The first one is on framework draft. Um, so so um, the changes from the 01 version is that uh, we add some tests to indicate that uh, in the young draft, we decided to uh, move some parts could be generic for other technology use. And then we also add some um, tests to describe that we what we have done uh, in last uh, IETF Hexon. And uh, another update is uh, we have a new co-author, Daniela from Nokia. And uh, immediately when we uh, finished update on zero one one version, we found that we um, have left empty on the uh, security section. So we have uh, another zero two 2 version. We fill up the, with the security session and uh, also fix some uh, editorial needs. So there's no technical uh, issue open for today uh, for this framework draft. Then uh, I think the next step will be uh, the working group not code. Okay, so the second one is on the young module. Okay, let's see. Uh, there are two main changes from the zero one version. The first one is that uh, uh, in last meeting we received some comments to review the model if some part could be generic for other technology uh, use. Then we revisited the model and uh, we decide to uh, uh, separate the interface protection part uh, as a generic part. So this one can could be used by other uh, technologies if they are interested. It's on the interface protections. And uh, then the next uh, change is that we also update the models to make it the NMDN compliant. So uh, this slide shows the details uh, about how we use that uh, protection part. Uh, the left side is uh, uh, the generic uh, interface protection. And uh, it's uh, defined some, for example, protection types and the working entities or some other related protection related uh, objects. And then in the micro radio link part, we make use, uh, actually it should be, the arrow should be right to that direction. We make use of the interface protection module and to use that in our microwave specific uh, module. So this is for the protection groups. Then next slide, please. So another update is uh, NMDA campaigns. So it's uh, just uh, reorganize and uh, rearrange on the module. Okay, uh, that's it for the update. And the authors believe that uh, we have finished all the technical work and the, the model is being complete and uh, stable. So we would like to ask for working group NASCO. Okay. Thanks a lot for being so quick. So before moving to questions and comments, uh, we had uh, we had a chat uh, with uh, with Deborah with uh, the members of the design team, and we decided to close. Uh, the design team uh, they did an excellent job with also a prize uh, at the itf hackathon uh, mm -hmm. was it in prague or in chicago in prague yeah best overall uh, <laughs> all the deliverables have been delivered mm -hmm. they've been adopted by the working group and uh, they are uh, uh, stable and uh, close to board the working group last call so thank you very much for all the hard work that you did. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this doesn't mean uh, that we are not accepting uh, any more uh, work uh, or contribution on microwave. Obviously, this was just the, the starting point. And uh, that's it. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I actually, I also would like to take the chance. We are also considering for next step to visit the topology argument for microwave. Okay. Thank that's, you. That's good. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Zhou Yifan from Huawei. Uh, I will uh, firstly uh, introduce the changes of uh, 
OTN topology drafts. Uh, in the OTN topology draft, they are at the very at the in, in the introduction part, we add a, a clarification <coughs> about the interface interface uh, independence and the applicability of the models uh, are described uh, is described in another draft. And for the young model, uh, the name attributes are removed and as the, they are covered by already by the TE uh, topology model and the client facing related attributes in the LTP are also removed. And uh, <coughs> there are three uh, attributes, uh, TPN range, TS range, and uh, TSG and added it to the link attribute. Uh, next, please. Uh, uh, in, for the newly added uh, attributes, and uh, they are um, especially for the TPN range and the TS range, they are uh, used. Uh, they are <coughs> for the interdomain scenarios. Uh, in the interdomain scenarios, uh, uh, for example, in the M ACTN, in the context of ACTN, the MDSC need to configure the interdomain links. So it's uh, the MDSC need to know the information for the uh, for the interdomain links, and the uh, each PNC will report the informations like the available TPN and the available TS range and it's similar for the TSG the granularity uh, for the link and uh, that's thanks and now this here this is the young tree currently there are still uh, some attributes not re uh, to be removed uh, as they are covered uh, by the T topology model uh, by the unreserved bandwidth attribute. <laughs> Next step, we will uh, remove. And uh, not, currently, this model is uh, an MDA compliant. And uh, next, please. And uh, so for the next step, so for the OTN topology model, we we will uh, remove the attribute, uh, which, is a co which are com uh, covered by the T topology model and uh, to align with the T topology model. And uh, uh, we are thinking about uh, whether to uh, report the multiplexing hierarchy of the interdomain links as there may be uh, different uh, multiplexing hierarchies on different domains or we can we, are, we can also uh, just uh, uh, simply assuming that uh, assume that uh, the, we only consider the uh, single stage multiplexing is also okay so it's a uh, uh, maybe it's open to <laughs> open to, to the working group so we can discuss about this uh, uh, attributes and the next phase and for the OTN tunnel model for the OTN tunnel model uh, uh, next, next. Uh, the changes are uh, simple uh, we align with the uh, uh, current uh, T tunnel model which is an uh, MDA compliant and uh, we add an RPC for fast computing and then rename the <coughs> I transport types module to the OTN types module and and the information in the uh, in, in the module is uh, uh, keep on changed uh, next next uh, here is a young tree uh, data tree for the OTN tunnel which is uh, compliant with the uh, uh, MDA and uh, next, thanks. And for the uh, newly added uh, RPC, it's uh, used for fast computing. And the input part, uh, there are three parts, which is a uh, general input and uh, constraints for uh, pass constraints and label constraints. And some of uh, some of the attributes are covered uh, in the are covered by the uh, pass computation drafts. So the next step will uh, align with the pass computation drafts to. Uh, to see how to to revise or just uh, remo uh, move the sum of the part to the uh, past computation drafts and next next and uh, for the input part of the RFC of uh, RPC sorry <coughs> for the input part of the RPC is there the general input part such as a request ID and source destination and the uh, priorities and such kind of attributes are already covered by the com uh, past computation draft. So 
may remove this uh, attributes and the uh, next steps. And uh, for the path constraint part, the in the for the primary path or the secondary path, uh, we use the the ERO uh, ex explicit routes objects are used to uh, describe the path, uh, segment of path. And uh, next, next. Uh, for the label constraints, uh, it's the uh, same as the uh, OTN tunnel model, the data model, uh, to <coughs> yeah to describe the uh, end of the tunnel or of this uh, path or or the end of this path. And uh, next, uh, for the output part, uh, it's also represented by the uh, explicit route, uh, explicit route objects. Uh, for the both uh, for both uh, for all the primary paths and the secondary paths, and uh, uh, next uh, for the next step we uh, is to, uh, we are trying to uh, we will align with the path computation draft and uh, uh, <laughs> any welcome uh, any comments are welcome. Okay, so it's uh, for the OTN topology model and the OTN tunnel model. So just just one quick comment. I think besides you need to align with the past computation draft, you also need to align with the you know uh, key tunnel draft. You know. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, hi, my name is Yang. Um, I update um, WSN Yang model. Next. Yeah, I think uh, because of NMDA issue, uh, this finally uh, we are NMDA compliant. And um, and actually, we also introduced a TWSN type model in this draft, which is another Yang module uh, to place all uh, WSN specific information such as WSN node types and the application code uh, for um, you know, based on ITUT uh, G.6982 for the compatibility for the um, proprietary interface. And the uh, wavelength assignment policy is all under uh, TWSN type module. Um, and also we cleaned up um, so that we only augment WSN specific link attribute from uh, T topology model. Next. Um, yeah, so this is a uh, basically um, WSN topology model. As you see, a lot of augmentation uh, from T tunnel model, a T a topology model, and only we just kept uh, what is uh, unique for uh, WSN. Next, please. Um, so I think um, most of the basic work is done, um, but possibly impairment data or we can integrate, uh, introduce as a link model uh, in the next revision. Um, um, so that the MDSC uh, can use those um, uh, impairment data for past computation. Uh, so this is um, one thing that remains to be done. Okay, so it's not quite stable yet. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, any question on topology model? Um, Dieter Beller, uh, Nokia. Uh, I have a few comments. Uh, there is no definition in the draft regarding the channel numbers. Uh, I think uh, you are defining those in the uh, wavelength range type. So what are the channel numbers that are being used in the draft? How they are defined? So which one uh, you're talking about? Um, the channel number? W's on Yang 08. So, which, which page? Which, here, there's a Yang model here, right? Yeah, yeah which, which attribute are you talking about? The channel number. Channel number? Yes. You think that's in the T topology model? 
No, I'm I'm asking where is the defined. Oh, what is channel number? Yeah. Okay. Um, could you flip through um Yang model for that? You know, I, I actually I forgot. I need to look at my Yang model. <laughs> yeah, but we can talk offline. Okay. Yeah. And I also have a few questions regarding the uh, grouping. Uh, sure. Use some link attributes. I think there are also some issues that uh, should be discussed. We can take that offline. I don't know whether you're. Okay. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I have one question, one comment. So regarding the next step, step you you said that you are going to add some impairment data on the topology young. You know, actually, um, this kind of information may depend on the uh, in, encoding for the impairment. That you know, the encoding for the impairment actually it is individual job. It may uh, take some time, you know, to move forward the encoding job. So mm -hmm. if you are going to add this kind of impairment information to the uh, W sound topology, maybe also it take it needs to take much longer time. Yeah. So we can either uh, move without this, and then later we think about augments. Right. That yeah. may be better. Oh, Consistent with GMPLS approach, like we did with the yeah. Encoding. Okay, no problem. That's even better. Maybe, maybe you can call it uh, like uh, impairment free and impairment aware, uh, like we did with the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yeah, this is um T um double sun tunnel model. Um, could you, next please. Yeah. So we did uh, clean up uh, quite a bit. Um, basically, we augment four things. Um, we augment T tunnel model. Uh, for basic configuration and global pass constraints um, for WSN wavelength assignment policy. And we also augmented um, ITF OTN types because OTN types now defines uh, client signal for source and destination. Uh, so we think that that's a good idea to augment OTN type. And uh, another one is um, IETF T WSN type. Uh, um, <coughs> for uh, wavelength assignment policy uh, for configuration. And uh, we augment uh, IETFT pass computation RPC mode uh, for uh, stateless uh, from uh, Italo and the Sergio's documents. So it compiles it magically, so that's, I'm so happy with that. Um, and then this is NMDA compliant model. Next, please. Yeah, so this is a basically, um, a, you know, IETFT WSN um, you know, tree look like. Um, as you see, for augmentation, uh, we only specify what is specific to WSN uh, TE. Next, please. So uh, we believe that this is a good base for uh, working group adoption uh, along with the T uh, WSN topology model. Okay. Any questions? Everyone wants to go to the social. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks. So you will go to the list. Yes. Okay. Now, actually, yes. Few words about that. We we want now to speed the things up uh, on young models. Okay. This means WSON, FlexiGrid, OTN, uh, Microwave. This is this is the highest priority because the market uh, window is open now and we need to hurry up. Italo is going to save us 10 minutes uh, with his speed. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Hi, everybody. I'm Italo Buzzi from Huawei. I'm providing some status update of the Transport MBI design team. Next, please. OK. So uh, the, the design, this slide summarizes the goal and deliverables expected from the design team and our working methods. I think we can skip it. Uh, next one. So what? We have done some work on, on the use cases that we are analyzing, and we have a three basically draft. One draft that describe what are the deployment scenarios that we want to for which we want to see how the existing YAM model can be used, and we have two drafts which are describing in details how these models can be used to address specific deployments, in particular single layer, single domain deployments, and single layer, multi-domain deployments. The first draft is uh, about the generic uh, applicability statement use cases, uh, which has been recently adopted as a working group document. And uh, we have made a few minor changes to clarify the intention of this draft. 
we don't see major open issues at this moment in time uh, on this document uh, and uh, we have uh, some uh, as a next step what we are looking for is to do some clean up of the text to avoid any misunderstanding of what we are talking about and uh, we are looking for uh, further feedbacks from the working group next and uh, for the use case number one so uh, the analysis of single domain and single layer we have uh, published the revision from the last itf meeting uh, where we have started to analyze how the model can be used to support uh, uh, Ethernet services, uh, Ethernet point-to-point -point services like EPL and VPL and OTN client like STMN, Fiber Channel over OTN. We found uh, some open issues uh, on how to use this model and uh, we have uh, some questions about how the T topology mode attributes uh, and the ITRS topology attributes fit together. We are uh, going to analyze uh, we have a minor issue about how to integrate the JSON code that we are developing into the draft. It's going to be fixed in a few days. Uh, so the next steps is to resolve this issue and to complete the document. And for the for the first issue, I have a dedicated slide. Next one, for the use case three, which is a multi-domain single layer, we have a new draft submitted in this meeting. Uh, we have uh, uh, started to analyze one of the major problems which uh, with multi-domain is how you stitch together the interdomain link. So the interdomain link is reported uh, as external domain links by two PNCs and the MDSC has to, to, to be able to understand how they are glued together. We have uh, started to good discussion, but we have not finished. So we have to finish it uh, and uh, we have to complete uh, the, the rest of the document. Um, next. Um, so. We have sometimes on the, uh, the open issue. So the big one has been uh, on the multi-domain is the inter-domain uh, stitching. We have been able, thanks to the help of Igor as well, and the, the T-topology social fan, analyze the, the plug ID. So the plug ID has been uh, an, uh, analyzed in two particular, and we see that it supports two cases. One case where this number is assigned by a central authority and configured on both PNC domains and reported uh, via MPI to the MDSC. The second use case is when uh, the two uh, edge devices auto-discover the link via LMP and uh, the information that is auto-discovered is reported to the MDSC. And, uh, uh, and by, uh, by this discussion, we noticed that the plug ID syntax had to be changed and the T-topology has been changed based on our feedback. So we have delivered the feedback to the T-topology model. That's uh, one of, was one of our tasks, and uh, this, based on this feedback, we have this. The, the structure allows also the coexistence of different mechanisms. So you can have a central authority on some links, uh, discovering on the other links, uh, there is no conflict, uh, or you can have uh, also different uh, auto discovery mechanisms uh, running in your network, and it should be everything should work with plug ID. A second issue, uh, the second option, which were, we, we have not finished, we, had, we didn't have time to analyze before this meeting, is that uh, we can uh, associate, uh, configure, either on the PNC or on the BSC, how the T, T node ID LTP ID on one side is matched to the T node ID LTP ID on the other side. Uh, the configuration on the PSC is already describing a topology uh, uh, ID from this. Uh, and there are some issues described there. The other case is not described because it's more an MDS internal configuration. Uh, what we are asking now, we are to analyze this one and we have to understand whether there are some issues with the option of plug ID that is analyzed that requires to, the, to look for other mechanisms. And uh, we need to understand what are the pros and cons of this alternative solution. And in case we have more options, uh, what happens in case for interoperability, if different uh, PNC and MDSC make different implementation strategies, what is going to happen? So these are the major issue. I have one question yes. on the on the plug ID. Uh, does it allow to understand whether the relationship between the two topologies is peering uh, or client server? And well, I think the link is to be peered by definition. The interdomain link is a is it the same layer? You're right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. okay, so any input, any comment on this open issue from the working group? Okay. We can. Next one is about the client services. Uh, okay, we uh, we have looked at the scenario, and we have found uh, uh, that uh, with the T, T, T's work documents, uh, we have some questions that uh, 
it's not easy to solve with uh, implementing all IT and T topology. The first question is, on which topology the Ethernet or other OTN clients like STMN, Fiber Channel, uh, Access Link should be reported in the OTN topology or should we have other topologies? And uh, if they have these access links uh, and we have the OTU tunnel, we have to configure the relationship because the T tunnel is between uh, P's and then we need to know which access link goes into uh, once you set up the T tunnel, you have to say on this the service is an association between the access link and the T tunnel. And also in case of EDPL, you have VLAN ID classification criteria that has to be clarified, uh, configured. VLAN number one goes over tunnel number one, VLAN number 10 goes over tunnel number 10. This information is not in the in the current e, uh, models. And uh, we have analyzed, we have started to analyze uh, two options. One option is uh, a set of drafts that has been submitted to this working group, uh, which uh, will are on the agenda. And uh, uh, basically those drafts have been triggered by the discussion. And another option we can analyze is the what open config is doing. That was raised a comment, let's look at it. And we have not yet started the complete analysis, so we have not taken any decision on as a design team. But um, we are open to suggestion or comments from the floor. Any comments? So I have one comment actually uh, I think actually um, I would like to uh, suggest the authors or design team to take Eagle's draft as input you know because that draft also talks about use cases and uh, describe how to use the young models for the transport network so that's a good foundation for for the uh, for the uh, design team to take as input you know? yes yes we we are taking it but we will take it, um, we will add it to the references, and we will see whether, are, whether it's missing there or whether, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello, uh, my name is Hong Mian, and I'm going to present uh, the three works about the young models for uh, OTN client uh, signals. They are respectively the service model for OTN client the topology model and the tunnel models. Next. So firstly, we are going to introduce about uh, the service mo client service model, which is different from the previously defined topology model and the tunnel model. So the most important issue for here is we need to understand where do the different models sit. So <clears throat> considering a multi-layer network scenario, there is usually a higher layer as a client and the bottom layer as a server. So uh, usually we have defined separately for each layer where is the topology and the corresponding tunnel by doing uh, uh, the tunnel is usually configured between the, the, the boundary of the, the uh, nodes calling the uh, TTP, and this is used to configure the, the network. Uh, consider the, the client service, it is usually defined in uh, 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 between the uh, URI reference point in the network, which can be the kind of reference point between the client uh, node and the server node for the interlayer link. So this means that the uh, uh, the server tunnel is usually used to carry the client service. As the tunnel is has this kind of relationship, so the tunnel is different from the client service, and they should be described in separate models. The next, please. So here we are using an example to describe how it uh, is applied between the different controllers, and we use the Ethernet over OTN as an example. So considering the MDSC and the PNC interaction, the first step would kick off the request of uh, Ethernet service. So that is uh, the, the, the client layer stuff. And uh, correspondingly, given this kind of request, the PNC would respond a message to set up the OTN tunnel. This is how the server layer would respond to the, 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 the stuff. And given this, uh, tunnel set up, so there would be a kind of virtual link, which is the dash line between the Ethernet service. Uh, that, that is a part of the client layer and appears dependent on the OTN tunnel. And uh, there would be corresponding 
topology change, which means that the controllers also need to update the Ethernet topology. And if we only focus on the Ethernet perspective, we can see that uh, given this kind of appearance of Ethernet link, we need together to update both uh, Ethernet topology, and then we can trigger the uh, tunnel establishment uh, based on the uh, Ethernet link. And this kind of tunnel can be used to carry the service from the upper layer of the Ethernet. So currently, we, we use this table to uh, summarize how many potential service types can be uh, in, the, in, in, in the client uh, service. This is, comes from the RFC 7139 about the OTNGP. And the, currently, the draft only contains the Ethernet details, and we are going to uh, develop other kind of uh, uh, service types in the, in the future world. So then we'll, uh, we would like to have a very quick view of the client service model and uh, our young tree. So the first one is the client service model. So it, pro uh, it is mainly used to requesting the client service by specifying different service attributes, like very global high level descriptions and the service type. And then uh, this young tree is shows the uh, parameters uh, contained in the Ethernet topology model. So this can be used as uh, uh, used when we need to update the client layer uh, topology. And this is an augmentation to the TE topology model. So um, this work, we, in this current version of the draft, we use the Ethernet as an example again. So finally, the model is about the Ethernet tunnel, and this model would be needed once there is a tunnel in the client layer. So again, Ethernet in this draft. So there are also a few open issues uh, in the current draft. The problem is the first problem is uh, uh, currently only the Ethernet service is included, and we need to add others. And the all, also for the Ethernet, so we also need to align with some other young models in the I2RS mode uh, and NAND mode work because they also have some kind of layer two stuff and together with IEEE 802.1. Then into, um, we are not sure if there are different client models like SDH, uh, 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 Ethernet, and uh, kind of uh, fiber class whether they have a common part to be generic or uh, there can be separate models. Uh, we, we, we will firstly define those kind, different kind of models and find whether it is. And uh, currently, the, the, the model is still not an MDA compliance, but we first want to clarify the technical stuff and then make it an MDA. So here we would like to confirm with the working group that the work is useful. And uh, this is actually, as uh, Italo presented, uh, this is triggered by the uh, discussion of the design team. And uh, we would like to work together and fit into the use case in the scenarios. That's the presentation. Thank you. Uh, can I have a con comment? So uh, definitely, I think this is uh, Amy from Huawei, sorry. So definitely, I think this is a very useful work, especially on the Ethernet, uh, because also Ethernet is a very uh, one of the popular uh, serv client service, even on microwave link. So we would like to see such work. And uh, I also have another comment. If uh, the uh, one of the common use cases in our case is that we were deployed a uh, QNQ Q Ethernet uh, model, um, Ethernet service. So. I'm not sure if the current model have addressed that or it should be addressed in future. Okay. Uh, currently, there is no QNQ stuff, uh, but we can integrate in the future. I, I, I agree with you that the microwave is a potential server to the Ethernet service, right? Yes, and, and not only microwave. I mean, uh, I, I, I see this. I, I probably already did this comment on the, on the mailing list. Uh, Probably generalizing this work is something that is really, really useful. Uh, as usual, my suggestion is to try to 
see what is the generalized part uh, of, uh, of it, bring it to this, and then do all the technology-specific uh, uh, extensions uh, in, uh, in CCAM. Yeah, yeah, I agree with this uh, approach, but uh, I would like to emphasize that this work are basically augmenting the TE generic models, so it's the, the, the scope would be still for TE. Um, yeah, I think this is a good start. Um, but in regards to um, w w you know layer one, actually we have a layer one connectivity service model. So you anticipated my second question. Right. So I think you know you don't have to do everything here, but focus on Ethernet and layer zero service. If it comes along, I think that should be separate service model. So I think um, if you focus on Ethernet, that's good base. I think just to move on. Uh, page two. Yeah, I agree. Actually, uh, in the slides, yeah, yeah, this page focus on the network side, and uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, supporting the interop on the MPI. So I don't think uh, it's a conflict with those kind of LX service model. But yeah, yeah. But I would like to. I I tend to agree with this because uh, there is a slightly. Uh, terminology issue because both of them seems to be called as service model but actually I'm not a, 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 an expert for terminology so we would like to hear from the working group whether there is some better name of, of this, such kind of work okay yeah Ethan Obuzi from away uh, two comments I think for Q and Q if it is a, a Q and Q point to point T tunnel it's the Ethernet tunnel in, that is supported here if it is uh, Connectionless Q and Q, then we don't have yet uh, analyzed that 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 option. So it depends on which type of Q and Q uh, implementation you are looking at. And uh, I, I support. I mean, the, the, this one is for the MPI, is not for the CMI. While layer one CSM is for this. So so you need to translate the layer one CSM request that the MDSC into these commands to that has to go to the PNC to to set up the physical network element. And maybe we we need to align uh, something. In, when we go to the generic client to make sure that the same ID is used <laughs> to some extent. So the same client is called in the same way, otherwise you have to do too many translations. Uh, two comments, uh, just in uh, Number one, IG Poly 802.1 is working on Ethernet and Q and Q and anything relevant to the work, so should probably be aligned. I'm not sure what they are in the work probably you should use the young catalog to check, but it should be aligned. Uh, number two, I2RS, as we know, is going south. So you had a point of aligning this I2RS. If I2RS is not there and drafts are in limbo, maybe we shouldn't. Or okay. We need to figure a way, so it's not a liability for us. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, the um, presentation about the young data model for uh, layer one uh, CSM, so layer one VPN. The starting point for this work was the RFC 4847 that provide a framework and the service lever requirement and in general describe all the deployment scenario for uh, uh, layer one VPN as a service. So. And this draft want to make a young data model for a layer one VPN. We prefer to call connectivity service model because we cannot talk about a layer one VPN as a service. So uh, in order also to make uh, the difference between layer one uh, CSM with the uh, layer one 2SM and the layer one and uh, layer two, uh, layer three SM. So next. Uh, this is the first deployment scenario that is uh, the um, simple. Uh, this is very simple because uh, we are talking about a, cu a customer that uh, want uh, layer one VPN services to a provider. So the layer one CSM in this case is uh, the modeling of the interface between the customer service orchestrator and the network controller. So this use case, uh, 
could be not so common, but uh, is useful to explain uh, also the second uh, scenario, if you could, can go to the next slide, where um, we have a, a, a very common use case, in particular in, in the same organization. We have the service as SDN uh, orchestrator, uh, service SDN controller for layer two or layer three services. And um, we have uh, the network as the end controller for layer one VPN. So in general, this is the use case where we have a layer one VPN, so a common backbone, a common transport network layer that is shared by different services. And in particular, different services can be different service department, for example, of the same organization or the same service provider, um, and so on. So this is interface makes sense in this, in this case and um, make also the difference uh, um, with the layer the layer 2SM and layer 3SM. So if we go to the next slide, we can see this difference. Uh, okay, the architecture is uh, the monolithic architecture, so it's very simple. Uh, for, uh, for now, it's out of scope, the multi-domain and multi-service provider use case, but just uh, to make you to understand that we have uh, the layer 2 SM and the layer 3 SM that is the interface between the customer and the service as the end um, orchestrator, while layer 1 uh, CSM is the southbound interface between the um, SDN controller and uh, the network controller. For uh, the layer 1 VPN for external customer, okay, is less common for now, but uh, we have to consider it. Next. Okay, this is uh, the first proposal for um, the service model. Um, the structure is very simple and follow the, um, the one that we use for uh, layer 2SM and layer 3SM. So there is basically the classification between a split between access and uh, access parameters and service parameters. And uh, please check, uh, and if you have comment, uh, we can change and uh, we can discuss. So finally, um, in some, in, we have the summary. So some operators are involved in, um, in the draft. Uh, Telecom Italia, Korea Telecom, uh, Telefonica, and um, in particular, as I mentioned before, in the context of a service provider network could be useful, in particular between uh, several departments, the one that uh, are more service oriented and the department that are uh, involved in the transport layer. And um, this uh, can be considered in the scope of the CCAMP uh, working group because it's about layer zero, layer one technology. And um, another question is um, maybe we need a liaison to MIF for this work. And um, the author soap, you can consider this work as a basis for, uh, for layer one with the answer this mode. Question? Hey, Dave Senecro, Ferguson. Um, actually, you took my question and you addressed it there with the MEF. Uh, should we send a liaison to MEF? I would say absolutely. Okay. Do you have any authors, co-authors from Nokia on your document? That are involved with also in MEF? The, the, I the am gentleman driving the work in MEF is from Nokia. Yeah, His yeah. name is Dave Martin. Yeah. So you may, if, if you do have co-authors from Nokia, you may want to get them to reach out to Dave. Okay. <laughs> the liaison to me. Liaison to me has been brought a few times this week, not only on layer one VPNs, but also on lifecycle management, some other work they're doing. So, from AB perspective, we are looking into it and we are, it's going to happen. Um, Sergio Berotti from Nokia, yes, I, I contributed this uh, draft, but uh, Dave is, uh, is uh, aware of that, okay, he's not happy of that because uh, there is not official uh, documentation from MEF, so I think that the liaison is, uh, is leading, is uh, absolutely needed to, 
make aware uh, both of the of the standard body of the activity. Is this uh, absolutely? Yes, I agree. This is young, and also in order to have a liaison, though, this has to be a working group document. Otherwise, there's no point. So. This I, is this is the first point. You're yeah, right. And right. the second thing is that we should, we sh the ITF should be aware of this work going on in in, in MEF. Yeah. But only only some companies have access to this document. So this is another so Mr. issue. Mr. Chairman, uh, let me ask you a question. Does it require a working group draft to have the two I, uh, C Camp chairs send a liaison to MEF asking for their work on layer one? <laughs> MEF should send it here, but given that MEF just had a meeting last week, and is <laughs> I mean, okay, so we can use the informal channels, I'm sure. But I, I don't think it would take a word. Yeah, but you, you, you know what's the problem of the MEF? It, this document uh, is not available to everyone. This document is not available to everyone. But uh. my point is this. We can either use the informal channels to go back and ask MEF to send a liaison to CCAMP, since MEF had no idea C-Camp was working on this until, well, they couldn't have because it happened after their meeting, right? Or I, I don't think it takes a working group draft document for the two chairs to solicit work from the MEF. This would be great. We rely on uh, your PR skills. <laughs> um, comment um, with a hat on, a formal liaison. <laughs> hey. Um, ITF's work is open. It's all open, right? And so I would say if, if MEF participants, you know, are, you know, are aware of this work here and they think it's interesting to MEF folk, they can just send an email on their list and inform them, or they can access this document. But it'd be very—it's not for us for us to hear the gossip that MEF is working on something and then we send them a liaison to ask for that information. You know, it's. You can uh, let MEF people know that would public, right? Give them the link. Say if they're interested. So that's, but that's MEF's. But that's MEF's. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, I I have one uh, interesting uh, comment for clarification. So, what do you mean layer one here? Do you mean that layer one is, you know, um, audio pipe, or it also includes, for example, W sound? No, it's just connectivity. In, just the connectivity, yeah. audio yeah. connectivity, or the, um, no. because I think people should have the same terminology in mind. It's not technology. Yeah. Yeah, because it's for the young tree, you define the optical interface. What is the optical interface, you know, actually? Yeah, but there is we, also protocol question. It depends. Or if we should uh, make some use cases about that. This is uh, some example. Yeah, this is right. But, uh, yeah. Maybe in the next version, we can add uh, an example section where uh, we can make out to use these uh, parameters. Yeah. yeah, right. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So ne next two presentation is a flex grid optical networks. Uh, first, um, um, topology model. Next. Um, yeah, this is uh, basically based on RFC seven six nine eight. Um, and uh, we extended from generic uh, T topology model. Next. Um, yeah, I think uh, this was the previous one, so we can move on to the tree. Yeah. And uh, it is an NMDA compliant. Um, yeah, so this is basically um, current uh, flex grid topology model. Uh, similar to WSUN model, uh, we cleaned up. Um, most of uh, overlapping parts, except um, you know, flex grid specific, um, uh, the things are listed in this um, model. Next, um, and this is a tunnel model. Um, 
you know, analogous to WS and T tunnel model. We also augmented uh, from T tunnel model and specify only a flex grid specific um, um, terminologies and the parameters here. Um, so um, I think I think it has been a while that um, this uh, draft has been presented in a CKM working group, um, and um, and I think uh, the only issue on the flex grid young, I think uh, we study if port should be LTP uh, to be more consistent with the T tunnel model. Um, and the um, tunnel model, um, I think the media channel may not be the best terminology, but the original author uh, wants to use that terminology. So that's one pending issue, but uh, it's not a big issue. And another um, uh, uh, issue is same LTP uh, port model. Um, um, you know, doesn't need to uh, use a transponder characteristic. So we're going to look it into to be more consistent with the um, um, uh, generic model. Uh, but other than that, um, uh, go next. Yeah, um, so we think that this is good base to be adopted as a working group. Um, and any comments? So, um... What, what are the issues with the terminology? Because this is the terminology of the framework. Media channel. Yes. Media okay, channel, then, network, media channel, and tunnel. Okay. You don't want to call T tunnel? Ah. Let's agree T tunnel. Uh, good point. We have misalignment between the framework and the, right. the, the, the other okay. young model. Please, Dieter. Um, Dieter Bell on Nokia. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for incorporating our comments that we provided at the last meeting. I think this is actually good. Uh, I have just uh, one comment uh, regarding the operational, uh, the available operational mode attribute. Mm. Uh, this is currently a read-write. Uh, I believe this should be a read-only. Oh, read-only. You're, you're right. Yeah, you're right. This is read-only. Okay, thanks. Regarding moving forward, as I said before, uh, our priority now is uh, to progress uh, the work on young models for uh, Wson FlexiGrid OTN uh, uh, microwave. So, okay, it's in it's in the pipe. All right, thanks. It's you. So, uh, I think that this is the third presentation on Flexi framework for uh, GMPLS control plane. Uh, we ha this is a four fourth version posted, and we've done a lot to the document. And it is basically two things we have been doing. Uh, we try to align it with uh, the work going on in ITUT and uh, as that work is also aligned with the OIF work, we should also be aligned by uh, to the OIF work, or the other way around. I don't know. They they are basically doing the same thing. Um, then um, we took away part of the document, especially we took away the use cases. Uh, we take took away the use cases not because we didn't like them, but course, they weren't actually focused on the control plane. They were focused on the more generic uh, flexi uh, behavior. Um, and then we have converged on terminology. I think we are pretty uh, w well done there. We have uh, done a lot of smaller uh, editorial changes, but we still have a lot of, uh, lot of we have some uh, document cleanup to to be to be done. Uh, the information we 
added is mostly responding to two comments we had last time. This is, and the comments were, this is unclear and this doesn't really capture what you want to do. And I think that's now is uh, well uh, inside the draft. Next time. Um, I did show this uh, last time. I, uh, we, I thought we needed a reference model uh, to actually be able to discuss things. Uh, and I have asked help from a couple of people that were involved in uh, creating a reference model for uh, uh, PWE free and uh, uh, MPLSDP to actually get all the, uh, the small nits and bits uh, in place. Uh, I don't have much to say about this. Next slide, please. Okay. So, uh, DMPLS might be used to set up a number of things in a flexi context. First of all, we could set up a flexi group. Uh, we have one problem where we haven't really uh, converged, and that's on the signaling channel. Uh, my understanding, and I think Chile's understanding and Rada's understanding are not exactly the same. Uh, but I think we are slowly com uh, converging, and we've actually sorted out. Uh, I don't see any really problem. It's just actually describe what, about how it is. So we can do things through and out the band signaling channel if we want. We can always do that for everything. Uh, when setting up a flexi client, we actually have a signaling channel available on the PHY, one to one type of channel or one channel available. Or oh, and we also have a signaling channel available on the uh, flexi group. We could use either. We need to decide how we actually want, how we don't, how and in what situation we want to use this, uh, those uh, use those channels, uh, and then we can use uh, Flexi to actually um, announce the PE parameters. Uh, we can use the GMPLS control plane to control plane to announce uh, Flexi PE PE parameters into the routing system. Next. And uh, then we can actually also use it to set up a uh, vanilla MPLS LSP, and that's actually the example we have in the uh, in these slides. Okay, um, so flexi configuration. Uh, an operator could take a number of different approaches. He could either configure the entire infrastructure and leave the uh, flexi uh, MPLS LSP over flexi to the uh, control plane only. Or you can set up uh, the uh, flexi, flexi client uh, with the GMPLS control plane and only configure uh, the, the, the flexi group. Or you can actually do everything from the control plane. Uh, the uh, discussion there is uh, how do we do with the, the, with the uh, signaling channel, but it's, I think we have it captured now, so it should work. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Next. So this is, uh, I mean, if we want to establish a flexi group, we have two boxes, the dotted lines. We have a, a data plane or flexi data plane and a shim on each side, uh, and uh, then we have click once. We have an NMS that are doing the configuration. Click one more. You have a routing system that actually is the ultimate recipient of the information. And then an NMS, yeah, so the NMS uh, tells the two boxes to establish the, uh, the flexi group. And then the, flex, uh, the node inside send the uh, information to the control plane that actually announce it into the uh, routing system. I think it's one more, yeah. So uh, we could also establish the flexi group from from a uh, from the control plane. And then uh, the trick here is that I thought, and that's uh, when I wrote, did the slides, that I actually need the outer band channel. Uh, Chile and Rada has actually taught me that I know I don't really need that. Uh, I can use the signaling channel on the PHY 
So as soon as the fire is connected, there is a signaling channel that I can use. So, um, you have to click one more. To the routing system, um, is that right? Yeah. Okay, go on. So the, the, the con centralized, centralized controller, for example, a PC box, whatever, tells the control plane that you want a, you jump too far. Back, back one. We want to do this. So, uh, when the flex, when the flexi group is there, the next step is to set up a flexi client. And now we can go ahead. Uh, so, and then you have a centralized controller, for example, PC, but it could be anything, and the PC. Uh, it tells the control plane that you want the, the flexi client sent up. The, flex, the control plane in the two nodes communicate with each other and actually are ordering uh, the uh, flexi client to be set over, up over the flexi group. So the uh, purple line inside the yellow is the flexi client. Okay, go ahead. So this is what could be the result. So flexi capable nodes, blue squares. Uh, you have links between those nodes, blue links and yellow links. The blue links are flexi-capable, and you have all the TE parameters. And it's possible to find a way for setting up a MPLS LSP that really requires to be run over uh, flexi-links. So I think you can click one. So you can, you can find a way through, and you can actually do the signaling uh, between the nodes, uh, based on, for example, an explicit ERO, uh, based on an ERO. Next step. So, uh, here I again talking about the approaches that could be taken by, by an operator. And it depends what, uh, who you are in the operator chain. So, if you own the entire infrastructure and own it all the way up to uh, the, the LSPs, then, yeah, then you may, might need uh, the um, control plane only to be able to set up a, a quick restoration. Otherwise, you don't really need it. If you are selling off, are selling flexi groups, uh, selling flexi clients, then uh, uh, you are in a different situation. And you really want to be able to sell flexi clients in a manner where you can actually guarantee that the taxi client you are selling to someone is actually reserved exclusively for, for that uh, for, for, for that for that customer customer might set up more than one more than, more than one LSP over that flexi client but no one else can set it up so that gives you an unimfringable bandwidth next next slide, please um, okay so that's where we are at the moment I would like to stress that I think, I think we are aligned with uh, other people working on Flexi. Uh, the uh, draft should be pretty clear uh, at the moment. And uh, I think um, what we would like to do is now have a, have a good review. I asked a couple of people that uh, uh, I know do good reviews to look at the document. Please, as a working group, do it also. Uh, we need that. Uh, but I don't think we have any, any showstopper now to go ahead and accept this working group document. Dave Senecro Berrickson. Um, so, so there was a liaison to CCAMP, I believe it was months ago uh, from the it broadband. Was pre prior to the previous meeting. Yeah, from the mm -hmm. broadband forum, letting, letting CCAMP know that broadband forum is doing similar work on a reference architecture and uh, nodal requirements. So it would be good for them. There's been a lot of discussion in those groups on what is the applicability of GMPLS to Flexi, and there's been a lot of confusion, to okay. be honest. So I would it would say be that good to liaise this document. I mean, obviously, it's public, but it would be good to send a, a response liaison back to BBF and say, look, we think if this gets adopted, look, we think this is stable. Here's what we think the applicability of GMPLS is. If we're going to ask, answer the question on what the applicability is, 
actually uh, false protection is one one thing and the other one is actually if you require to run over um, but so so your diagram where you're showing the selection at the client layer of flexi capable links yeah. is the first time I've seen that type of architecture what I've seen in other sessions has been the signaling of uh, flexi some mysterious flexi information that allows a flexi path to be created through the network at the flexi layer and their question come right yeah. yes exactly yeah. the question comes in what is the label in that case and is there something called flexi switching and categorically people deny that there's no flexi switching and yet, how does one create a flexi path without flexi switching? This is the first time I've seen something that even resembles a path through the network, but it's a chain well, of flexi links. The, 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 what we are actually communicating is link capabilities that the path require. And that's why, why we need the, uh, the routing system. Uh, that's the one question for clarification. Please go up. Uh, I think here you mentioned the MP RSFT. Uh, do you just use this as an example? Uh, it could be maybe other RSFT, just a client layer RSFT, that's fine. I couldn't really hear you. Yeah. Uh, Can you speak to the mic? Okay, sorry. So uh, I just want to ask uh, the flexi client setup triggered by request request for MPS RSP setup. Uh, and here you use the MPSP. Uh, as you know, that uh, maybe we can use Ethernet to carry other traffic, and maybe some uh, not not. not I, I, I can try to answer. And if I see if I can understand the question. So if you want, if you have the flexi groups established and you want to set up an MPLS LSP over uh, those nodes you need to also establish the uh, in-between node link on the flexi client level before you can set up the uh, MPLS LSP am I clear let me ask a question in another way so uh, does the MP, uh, MPS SP here has a strong relationship with uh, FlexE? So. That's the, I don't, can, can. So, so I guess the question is, what is the relationship between the LSP that you're talking about setting up here with GMPLS and the FlexE that's set up underneath? And how do they relate to one another? Because they, they, let they, me let me say a, a common misconception is that you're using flexi you're right, using right. GMPLS to set up the flexi groups, but that's not what you're doing. So actually, anything that is established in the the the, the flexi layer group or client that is actually announced to the route uh, into the routing system. The routing system knows uh, uh, what the quality of or the capability of the links in the network are. And here we actually say that we, we need uh, TE parameters to actually describe the TE links. So when setting up an LSP, you can pick the, the right type of, of, of link. Okay. I think Was that an answer to your question? Yes. I will do. So David, I think you are required to speak to the mic. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so instead of say instead of flexi between the two nodes, they're using lag, right? And so, it, at some point, the lag bundles three links together and then announces to the routing system that this is one aggregated link of some you know so much bandwidth. It's really no different than what's happening here. The the flexi bundles are being connected together and then are being announced to the routing system as a constraint. Okay, Gabriele Dieter, and then we have to cut the line. Okay, Gabriele Galimberti, Francisco. 
Um, do you think uh, to extend also uh, the LSP uh, to the case where uh, actually the LSP uh, is uh, uh, carried over a DWDN network so that uh, your uh, LSP capable interface is becoming is connected to an LSP capable transponder and then you have a uni interface in between? This is the question. So I'm um, again I'm not exactly certain what you're asking. You're just saying uh, in other words, uh, the the shim connecting the yeah. two LSP uh, capable nodes may be a DWDM network. At this point, uh, you need to uh, interface your interface your, the the uh, <clears throat> the flexi capable node interface uh, to a uh, LSP capable transponders, and then you have a uni signal in over there to negotiate the bandwidth. I think the answer is yes, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, the um, the nodes we've been looking at can take in, uh, well, an LSP on one side and actually map it down to the uh, to the flexi client. But that's I don't see a problem. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dieter, uh, Nokia. I would like to echo what uh, Dave just said. Uh, I also get uh, comments from experts, uh, uh, from my colleagues, uh, who are saying that uh, th this draft uh, uh, assumes that there is flexi switching capabilities in the network. It in the does, network, not does not assume exist. that it's flexi capable okay. for switching. And secondly, I think uh, uh, there is also a locking mechanism defined, uh, which would allow to change the bandwidth of the Flexi group, uh, which is also something that's probably not aligned with the uh, Flexi implementation agreement. I, I, I don't get that really. Can I? Can I see you? Can, 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 can you repeat, please? Yeah, there is an administrative uh, locking function defined, uh, and you can actually then uh, add or remove uh, ties from that group. And I think that's not aligned with the implementation agreement of Flexi. Okay. Right. I can. I, we can take that offline. Yeah, I can yeah. take it offline. I would be interested because I. Uh, but I, I thought you also said that they assumed that we do uh, Flexi switching. We're not, definitely not. Uh, and it actually were a hint that we could do it in the uh, version two of the draft, but it's been out since then, and that's four and a half year. Okay. So, okay, I think uh, more questions can go to the list. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Chile, the president. And uh, this is presentation uh, includes two drafts. One is the beyond 100 gig framework control plan technology, and the other one is the signal things. So, okay, thanks. Uh, during the program meeting, the first version of the model draft, the framework draft was uh discussed and uh, we also have some uh questions uh, some topic to discuss with what is otoc or otoc dsm or otoc rsp discussed but we have not included this in the framework document so just uh, uh some changes were made in the draft at a new section to describe what is this rsp so Actually, the RSP is a number of end-to-end -end instances bound together as a group. So uh, that is the definition. So and like, uh, what the control plan needed to do, the control plan, it just need to finish the setup, the finish the bounding of this instance, as well as indicate some slots that may, may be available. Uh, this is the first turn. And second one is, uh, uh, the, the second one is, uh, 
set up of audio K over audio thing, and after that discussing, we think this, uh, this can be this can be solved by reuse the mechanism defined in FC seventy one. Uh, 39. It's because as one configured audio sending has almost the same factor as, uh, as audio K. So the beyond 100 gig control plan title mainly in this draft is to focus on setup and for focus on the bonding of these instance. Also some uh, use case sections I combined into one category as they all represent the transportation. Uh, on non OTN client signal over OT flex and then over OT OTN connects. Mm -hmm. Just some restructs job. Okay, next. Okay. Uh, and the following is the uh, signaling draft. Uh, just before this IETF meeting, uh, the their, their reverse of the signaling extension was uploaded. So, next page. Uh, first, let's take a look at uh, uh, the extension included in this uh, draft that's our overrail. Uh, a new uh, encoding type, uh, J.709 audio signal defined because uh, in the latest version of J.709, the audio signal actually plays a digital section layer rules instead of uh, a digital pass layer. Uh, which is the rule that audio K play. Also, four new payload area introduced that uh, they don't exist in the 2012 version of Z.709, and they are based here. So, next. Uh, the traffic parameter for audio scene uh, is also uh, comparing to the RFC 7139, uh, there, there are also some changes to this, uh, to this object, the traffic parameter. Uh, currently, we are on this, this project, this, sorry, this object only call includes the signal type, which can be these three different signal type, and the number of uh, instances requested, and the bit rate and MT. Uh, they are all, they, we just try to reuse these two fields, which is also in, described in the RFC uh, seventy-one thirty-nine. Okay, next. <coughs> okay, um, next one. We define the label. We use the label to indicate the instance bound uh, in this audio CN or in this audio CN. Which and the label actually include the uh, n blocks. With each block include the instance ID, the bitmap length, and the slot bitmap, and the number of available slot. And the bitmap length and the slot bitmap here is actually used to indicate the position of available slots when signaling is used to set up the audio scene pass or audio scene OTU scene DSM pass. Okay, next. Oh, sorry. Also, some uh, other TLVs are defined. We define a new TLV, available slots collection TLV, uh, which is a new kind of a RSB attribute TLV. It's, uh, uh, this TLV is extended to collect the available slot information for end to end audio scene RSP. It's because uh, one audio scene RSP may spy multiple audio scene or audio saying that's a link. Also, the uh, interface RD, the SVP hub object must be used in reservation methods, and it contains several TLVs to indicate which component interface is used to carry a specific audio say or audio say instance. So, okay, thanks. Uh, this slide just uh, gave some uh, description of how to use uh, Object or TRV defined in the signal draft. Uh, for actually, uh, in the current version of the signal draft, we think this is a still a um, uh, multi layer uh, scenario. Or we consider that it's a case of a setup of a hierarchical LSP. 
It's because one, just like an example, one end-to-end -end, uh, OTOC 3 RSP can be carried over three different OTOC and OTOC and that's an um, RSP which are con connected together. So uh, this here just give uh, uh, some description of how to use the traffic parameters for requesting the uh, RSP with kind of the case of say and saying that them with available slot here. Yes. You, you have more minute. One minute more. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, also here we just give some description of the label. That's how to set a label, how to set a bitmap, slot bitmap. Okay, next. Uh during the discussion we also have some open issue. Um I think we need to discuss this this week. Uh first one is audio sync, audio sync and uh, audio that's uh, um, it can not be switchable. So why is the so-called end-to-end RSP? Because there is no label to be switched. So I think we need to discuss this. Also, uh, another issue is how can we define the bounding action? Can we call this uh, the setup of RSP? It's uh, currently no answer. We need to discuss this. And the third one, so is there a bounding of OTOC instance in one OTOC because uh, some authors think that uh, the OTOC and RSP need, may not need to be explicitly specified. So we, uh, we need to solve this problem, I think. Okay, next. Uh, next step, I think we need to keep, discuss, keep discussing the framework and the solution and uh, some alignment work need to be done between the framework and signaling and the writing drafts. Also, we need to discuss whether the use case document in the framework draft still need to be kept because there are so many use cases. If not, we need to remove them. Okay. Uh, that's all. Oh, also, uh, tomorrow morning, we also will meet at the de registration desk at 9.30 a.m. to discuss about it. If you are interested, please come. Okay, join. Thank you. Next, please. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Zhou Yufan from Huawei. So uh, uh, as the uh, routing extension is uh, uh, closely related with uh, uh, signaling and the framework draft. So we uh, just upload this uh, routing extension merge draft to uh, before just before this uh, ITF, and uh, this uh, draft is uh, uh, still in in progress, and the detailed uh, technical points uh, are still under discussion. So I will uh, this draft uh, actually merges two drafts. Uh, about the routing extensions for beyond 100, uh, 100 giga uh, OTN, and uh, all the uh, the extensions uh, actually mainly focus on the SCD part. And next, next. So, so for the first uh, draft, and uh, it's, uh, this draft has been presented uh, in previous uh, IETF meeting. So uh, in this draft, uh, it, uh, type three, uh, bandwidth of TRV is defined for the OTOC in container, and uh, the TSG is extended for 5G granularity. The unreserved bandwidth is not included as the uh, OTOC is not switchable. And, uh, next, thanks. And uh, this is the detail of uh, the label introduced in the first draft, and it's also uh, presented has have been has been presented uh, in previous ITF. And for the second draft, uh, the second draft uh, uh, extends the type one bandwidth of TRV uh, for OTOC for OTOC in container. And uh, as uh, OTOC in signal type is uh, has only uh, only has one granularity, which is five G. So the TS TSG is not extended, and uh, the number of TS is uh, uh, used to indicate the number of uh, Available Q, uh, available uh, tributary slot, uh, which means uh, the tributary slot can be occupied. Uh, it's different from the uh, can be uh, allocated. Uh, how to say? There are two 
okay this this is uh, amb ambiguous actually this term as they are as there are uh, two bits in the for the for each audio same time slots it can be occupied or it can be marked as unavailable so this is uh, so this is used for the availability and uh, so in the in the merge draft uh, actually the merge draft uh, merge the two uh, the two drafts and uh, so the te uh, the technical point for the lip for the uh, ICD part is uh, uh, actually combined uh, the, the two two drafts and uh, uh, defines a type three sub a bandwidth sub TRV and uh, extend the the uh, 5G granularity as uh, there may be more granularities for the audio scene so and uh, a bitmap is uh, used to indicate the exact locations of the unavailable uh, tributary slot information. Uh, although it's a, as uh, Chile has introduced the, uh, for in the signaling graphs, although it's the uh, yeah, unavailable t uh, TS information is uh, uh, described in the signaling part, but uh, actually I think this uh, is, uh, uh, this information is actually is uh, about the node capability, so which is which should be carried in the routing advertisement. So it is uh, uh, it's added in the merge drafts, and uh, so here is the difference uh, compare comparison of the difference of uh, three drafts. We can see that the merge actually the merge drafts can combine the two uh, two drafts uh, first first uh, the. RSP encoding type for the audio CN and the uh, uh, bandwidth sub TRV type and uh, extended the uh, uh, tributary slot granularity and define a, a unreserved bandwidth for the audio CN connection setup and the information about the available tributary slots. And uh, so, next step we will be. Yeah, we are open to discuss and uh, revise the technical uh, detail for the merged uh, routing drafts and uh, any comments are welcome. Thank you. Comments, questions? I have a quick one, which is uh, since you are defining a new switching capability, please consider using the generalized SCSI. Generalized SCSI. Okay, okay. We will, we will uh, try to align. Consider, consider this. Okay, thank you. Next. Hello, it's Hao uh, from Huawei again. I'm going to present this work talking about the interworking of the GMPRS control and the centralized uh, controller system. So we are going back to GMPRS again. And uh, firstly, I would like to introduce the motivation of this work uh, because uh, uh, we have been working on the GMPRS as a control plane technique for a couple of years. And uh, it, uh, before the, the controller uh, emerged, uh, the data plane is, uh, consistent, uh, is, is working consistently with, uh, with the control plane. But nowadays, with the involvement of the uh, controller system, we have also developed a kind of a group of a branch of solutions that how the uh, controller system interact with the corresponding device. So it would be interesting if we can further understand okay how the kind of distributed flavor of solutions like GMPRS and the uh, centralized flavor of uh, system like uh, uh, controller system they can coexist and work together. So. Example protocols in the GMPRS control plane may include the RSVPT uh, protocol for signal and the OSPFT protocol for, for, for routing. And uh, correspondingly, mm, there has been a few uh, newly emer emerged techniques like RESTConf protocol and the young model defined for a kind of centralized uh, device configuration. And we also have a kind of a PCE protocol to use as a kind of centralized routing or pass computation. And the uh, objective 
objectives of this draft can be divided into three different issues. The firstly, we would like to check the cur current uh, uh, architecture from different uh, functionality that we make sure that the current architecture satisfies all of the, of the requirement. And uh, we would like to understand how the existing solutions can be applicable to this kind of architectures. And uh, during this procedure, we believe that there can be a kind of potential gap analysis. And for example, next slide, we <coughs> show uh, uh, an example in the GMPRS together with the ACTN architecture. And uh, as you can show, uh, as, as you can see in this figure, this is a kind of multi-window, multi-domain stuff. And uh, we, uh, we have GMPRS as a, 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 a distributed uh, control plane technique. While we also have the REST compound uh, and the young model as MPI solution. So <clears throat> there, uh, we, we need a kind of consistency and neat uh, uh, approach to make these two systems uh, interwork together. And in, in this page, we try to list uh, a few different uh, 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 consideration on, on how this uh, co uh, interwork with each other. For example, on the uh, southbound interface between the PNC and the interface, how the GMPRS or, uh, can help report the topology we may have different uh, uh, alternatives like uh, PCERS from the centralized uh, style, or we can have a kind of OSPFTE in the in the distributed uh, function. And the second issue would be like uh, uh, considering the interdomain link and MDSC need to gather information, but usually it is a kind of stitching from the uh, information reported from PNC and how the GMPRS can represent this kind of information to PNC would be a key approach to this problem. And correspondingly, uh, the next issue would be interaction request for the RSVP, because usually given a kind of PCE protocol, if we initiate the, uh, uh, the path establishment from the, uh, from the hand, uh, head and node, it would run the RSVPT uh, uh, signaling accordingly. But actually, given the multi-domain case, there would not be an explicit uh, ERO function to describe each node in the other domain. So that would be taken care from the other kind of controllers. And finally, the most uh, advanced issue would be the kind of protection and recovery. This would also request uh, uh, very accurate interworking mechanism between the device level and the controller level. So some kind of uh, intra-domain uh, protection and recovery is very different from the inter-domain operations. So here we are trying to uh, uh, introduce some issue and examples for our uh, interworking consideration and uh, in the next step we are going to bring more details and uh, describe some uh, typical interworking scenarios and during the procedure we if we detect any kind of gap we would like to uh, uh, continue our working on uh, extending those kind of protocols and but before doing that we would like to confirm with the working group that we are doing the right job to say that this work is useful You go first. I'm Dieter Beller, uh, Nokia. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, actually, I uh, I think this is a, a good uh, uh, piece of work because uh, it shows actually uh, how GMPLS networks could actually interact with uh, the ACTN uh, components. Uh, can you go back to uh, to the previous slide? I think I can answer easily uh, question number one. Um, the PNC, of course, of each domain could actually listen to OSPFTE, and then it gets the topology. Yeah, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah. This uh, I, I think it is not difficult to have one answer, but uh, it is uh, really hard for different people to have the same understanding on how to solve each of such kind of problem. So it may be clear to give better description on how this work is done. Uh, I agree with Dieter on the usefulness of uh, of this work. Uh, 
I'm, I'm again uh, wondering what is the relationship with uh, the transport and BI design team. It's probably something that fits in there. Uh, I think uh, it would go a little bit beyond the uh, MBI or the MPI in the ACT because mm -hmm. it is more uh, device level interaction and uh, some device uh, attributes may be taken into account. Yeah. It, it does begin, I agree with Amir and I think uh, in the design team we are looking more about what M how MDSC and PNC interact with each other we do not care because we are looking at the MPI and, and the interoperability space, how the PNC translates uh, the uh, information that the MDSC provides into action in the network. Also because in the network you can have GMPS or whatever you like. Uh, so I think this is uh, second also the point. This is useful because it complements it say, when you get this information and you are running GMPS, what the PNC can do, that's useful information. Since GMPS is one of the major SBI protocol, especially defined here. Thank you. Okay. Um, Young Lee Huawei. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very useful work. Uh, my question, the only question is, are you also scoping PSAP within this picture? When you say GMPLS, do you also include PSAP or not? Well, currently, uh, currently I, I categorize the, uh, the PSAP as a part of uh, centralized uh, uh, past computation mechanism. Uh, GMPRS is a kind of uh, uh, distributed ones, but you are right, uh, they are highly associated with each other on the SBI, right? Yeah, so my qu suggestion is maybe working with PC working group together with CCAM to figure out a little bit bigger scope of alternatives because PSAP, you know, centralized uh, method is now, uh, if I understand, based on offline discussion, it's going to take off. So. Uh, this is very useful work, but in terms of scoping, right? So, um, if you consider that, that would be. Yeah, I think that's dependent on uh, the result of the gap analysis. Right. We yeah. we have a comment from from Julien. He says it seems to me that there is much overlap with existing uh, PC documents, like uh, forty six fifty five. Thanks, Young. I agree with you. My just a short comment in the sense that I support this uh, this work and it is is uh, is very interesting because for the first time it's try to define interworking between GMPLS uh, and SDN control uh, and also open the door on the need uh, what uh, mentioned by Italo now yes in the transport design team we just analyze basically MPI interface but uh, this draft. Uh, uh, make clear that uh, also work on the SBI, I think ITF uh, has to do. It is important to do. Yeah, Rüdiger Kunze, Deutsche Telekom, same direction as Julian uh, just mentioned. So what kind of problem do we want to solve here with this solution compared to the existing solutions that we have with PCE? So if it's going more to SDN, so then PCE and, and NetConf are almost not the right uh, mechanisms to address this here. So then I2RS maybe is the best, uh, is, is more or less a way to uh, move forward. Who said that NetConf and PCE are not SDN protocols? Depends on the definition of SDN. <laughs> Just to answer uh, your point again, um, so for me, SDN is uh, programming the forwarding plane uh, of a network, and um, yeah, you can do it with NetConf and PC and PSEP. Okay, this is Gabriele Garimberti from Cisco. And uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the possibility to extend uh, uh, the current signaling on uh, the SSON, also to cover the uh, um, carrier uh, 
part uh, and uh, the interface, the client uh, and network interface. Next, please. Um, so even if uh, we have, uh, uh, let's say, pretty excellent uh, uh, 76.99.98, sorry, that is uh, uh, defining the framework for the SSON and uh, also 66.99 and 77.92 to define the signaling of a media channel, we don't have actually the possibility in case uh, uh, we want to, uh, let's say, define and signal what is inside the media channel between the two clients. Next, next, again, again, please. Okay, here is uh, uh, the picture that describes a little bit uh, the issue. So supposing that uh, we have uh, an edge node that uh, has uh, a multiple DWDM interface or uh, SS1 interface connected to the client, to the core node, and then suppose that uh, uh, the edge node wants to ask for a media channel to connect uh, the uh, tail end node. So basically, uh, Okay, GMPLS can calculate the media channel, can define the path, can define the N and them value, but cannot, or if it is able to do, uh, to define the frequency of the different subcarrier, uh, then uh, has to uh, signal to the edge node this frequency. Next. And uh, on the other side, the edge node, uh, how can ask to the core node what kind of circuit wants? For example, can define number of channels that can be fixed or uh, maximum, and can define the total bandwidth. For example, over 10 four carriers, the, the edge node can ask for a 400 gig uh, channel or uh, maybe an 800, big, uh, an 800 gig channels and then let the GMPLS calculate how to implement that. I mean, uh, for example, 400 can be implemented with four channels or carriers running at 100 gig and the specific modulation format, while can be as well calculated and implemented uh, using just two subcarriers running 200 gig and also, again, a different modulation format. Go ahead. On the other side, when the GMPLS calculates everything, uh, has to tell back the edge node about the modulation format, the FEC, the baud rate, and also uh, the position of the subcarrier inside the media channel. So J and K are reported to, uh, next slide, are reported and related to the uh, media channel central frequency and of course the media channel width. On top of that, next please, uh, we have defined also the relationship between uh, the carrier and the port, and also uh, the carrier power. Very quickly, uh, I think we address uh, a real issue here, because uh, um, we realize uh, right away during the implementation of this SSON that uh, something was missing. And uh, um, I would say we are available to explain in detail why uh, something is missing and how the real issue uh, is addressed here. So uh, I would really uh, encourage to uh, either meet in person or uh, run uh, on the mailing list uh, any comments uh, and we'll ask. Thanks a lot. Um, Dito Bell Nokia, uh, I think we don't have to dis rediscuss again what we have discussed in the past. Uh, um, I do have uh, reservations. Uh, I know this is uh, an experimental uh, draft. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this is uh, specifying a proprietary solution, so that's, that's, uh, that's just for the records. Thank, thanks, Dieter. No, really, uh, we, uh, again, I encourage you to, uh, to discuss uh, uh, what are we, uh, we are addressing here, uh, because uh, even if uh, you don't uh, have uh, uh, yet uh, this kind of problem, uh, you will have soon to, 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 to solve. 
Thanks a lot. Thank you, Gabriele. So this presentation addresses um, two drafts. Um, the first one, I, I just want to explicit uh, mention that Nokia and uh, Dieter is, is only supporting uh, the first document here. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, based on the framework document dealing with the optical interfaces, that are not um, part of the managed domain um, of the optical network, so managed by a different uh, network management, for example. Um, we are using LMP and the extensions of LMP here in this both documents to exchange the properties of um, one side the optical line system and on the other side the interface itself. Uh, we defined uh, certain or different um, sub-objects um, based on RFC uh, 4209 here in these documents. So first of all, to negotiate the capabilities of the line system and of the transponders. So therefore, we added the application codes and the application identifiers. We are supporting as well uh, a superset uh, of uh, parameters that are defined in the current specifications uh, of uh, ITUT. Um, I have to mention the first document that we um, are discussing here for the single channel optical interfaces is on standards track. The second one is an experimental draft. Um, for the second one, we're addressing the multi carrier. Um, optical interfaces for spectrum um, switched optical networks. So same things, we have to exchange um, or the, 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 um, um, the parameters uh, here, not for configuration, that's very important, uh, just to figure out which capabilities we have on, on both sides. Um, next page. Yeah, I think, um, for the current version, so we updated uh, both documents uh, for this ITF meeting. We did a little bit of uh, bug fixing, um, not so much things, and reshaped the documents a little bit and uh, added some um, parameters uh, on the on the draft for the flex grid. Next page. We can jump over this. Yeah. So. Um, Additionally to the, the uh, application identifiers or application codes, we added the, the output power and the current input power for the single channel interface document. So that's uh, one thing uh, we have to mention here. And next page. On the other side, um, a little bit more uh, parameters are needed to exchange. So all the details are in the, in the draft. You, can read it and uh, give feedback uh, to that. Um, next page. Yeah. And that's the last one. So we want to um, request feedback from the working group. And we think at least the single channel interface draft is, is um, ready to for working group adoption. OK. Um, Dieter, Nokia. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding the new parameters you, that you introduced, uh, the uh, max pole power difference and the max pole skew difference. I didn't find definitions of those or references uh, to definitions of those uh, parameters. You will probably see in the next uh, I2T698.2 that is, uh, is coming. Okay, so please add them. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, 
there is another comment from Juliana, but I think it's uh, uh, it refers to the previous uh, to the previous presentation. Uh, the comment is uh, uh, experimental, but targeted to CCAMP, not the individual stream. I think it's a com counter comment to yours, Julian. Okay, we are ready for the last uh, presentation. Oh. Yes, Stephen. hello, everybody. Do you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, Please. great, thank you. Yeah, so this is a little bit uh, another kind of module. This is a generic alarm module that lets devices present their alarm state. Uh, first question, it's hard for me to see which of you will raise your hand, but how many of you have read the module at all? A couple of words? Some, some, some of them. them. Some okay, of them. Good, good. I will keep this fairly high level. Uh, so next page, please. Yeah, okay, the, and the next one. Let's see. We can take the next one. Yeah, there, there is a little bit of delay. If you yeah. could tell us yeah. uh, the, the, the title of ah, the okay. slide. This, uh, this, one, this one is OK. Um, so it's, it's me and Martin Birken that is working on this one. I would like also to, to thank. There's been relevant input already. Uh, I had one this morning from Balash from Ericsson. I've had good input from Joe and Nick from Adra, and also Lo Berger from Naban. So good iterations on the email list already. The, the main features of the module is a way to represent the alarm list, which means what are the alarms on the system. Uh, a couple of things here is that if, if there is a cleared alarm, meaning from a resource point of view, it's cleared, it still stays in alarm list. There are other definitions of alarm lists out there which behave differently. Uh, there is also an Yang feature to support operator actions on alarms, the classical one, like, like acknowledging. Um, there is what I think a very important thing, which is sometimes lacking, which I call the alarm inventory, a way for the system to publish the possible alarms. Um, today, it might be the case that you get a document from the vendor in the free format and, and then some kind of protocol, but this module lets you ask the system which device, which kind of alarms will you actually publish. And there is also a way to block and filter alarms. I call it shelving, you reusing a term from the process industry, which to some degree is a little bit more mature in, when it comes to alarms than, than, than uh, we are in IP and telco sometimes. And you can also do some administrative actions on alarms, like deleting alarms and then purging the history. In some cases, you might have a more telco-oriented management system, and there's also a separate module here which lets you map the alarms into the classical telco standard X733. But note well, this is a separate module. It's not part of the core module at all. Uh, next slide, please. Good. Good. So, when we say alarm in this module, we are referring to an alarm as a state on a resource, not a notification. So conceptually, an alarm is some an undesirable state in a resource that requires corrective action, meaning this is not for events in general, this is not for logging in general. Every alarm is important and it needs someone to take an action, a human or a software, but the meaning is don't use this to throw just events into it. It's serious things that someone needs to take action on. If, if that's not true, it shouldn't go into this alarm module. It should go into logging somewhere. That's the first thing. And the second thing to note is that we take a stateful approach when we talk about alarms. The alarm list is built on... You have two minutes. Sure. So was there a question? Okay. Uh, yeah. So if you look to the list to the left here, when we say alarm here, we mean a resource like a specific interface. Oh, sorry. Uh, go go back once more again. 
go back to the previous slide. That's perfect. Thank you. What is an alarm? So when we say an alarm, uh, it's a specific resource, could be a specific interface, a specific disk or a specific detector or something. And then a specific type of alarm. So those two together are the key in the alarm list. Uh, it has a severity and a separate clearance flag. So if there are some alarm geeks in, in the room here, um, some alarm standards sort of confuse severity levels with clearance. Is the alarm cleared or not? That's one thing. The severity of it is another thing. And so you have a list of the resources, their alarm types, their current severity, and if they're cleared or not. That's the focus of the alarm module. And as a side effect, we will emit NetConf notifications, where some modules more stays on the right, focusing on the notifications themselves. We focus on the states themselves. Next slide, please. Good. So here we see the alarm list itself. We will focus on a couple of things. Again, repeating what I just said, you can view the alarm list as a function. So from a specific resource, a specific alarm type, what's the current alarm state? So that's the purpose of the alarm list. It's a function of that kind. It's not a notification log. And again, clearance is separate from severity. So what you see here to the right, you have a read only alarm list. The keys are resource, the interface, for example, the alarm type, the specific kind of alarm. I will return to that. And those are the keys. That's important. So the time is not the key. The resource and alarm types are the keys. And you can see further down that there is a separate field saying is cleared. Is it cleared or not? Which is separate from the current severity level, which is perceived severity. Then for each alarm, you can have a history of state changes from the underlying resources. So an alarm might go from warning to minor to cleared to major again. So the state. Sorry, uh, sure. Stefan. So um, could you uh, move forward quickly? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm, co we are yeah, I'm coming to the end. This is the important thing. So this will actually be my last slide. The other slides are for reference. So this is the core thing. No, please go up again. Previous slide. That it will be my last slide because that's the important thing. No, up, up again. Stay on the list. So there, yes, stay on this one. This is my last slide. Uh, so that's the status changes. You can see the the history of what has happened with the alarm from resource point of view. Then, separate to that, further down, there's a list called operator state change, meaning an operator might have acknowledged the alarm, might have considered the alarm as being closed. That's separate list. So there is no thing like a, an operator clearing alarm. That, that's two different perspectives. So this is the alarm list, and that's the heart of it. And notifications will be emitted from this one. And uh, the other mechanisms you can read in the RFC. You can block and filter alarms. You can query the system. What are the possible alarms that can be emitted? So that, that's the main thing around this module. So any questions? OK, there is uh, no question from the floor, but just a consideration from my side. Well, actually, uh, I'm happy that the, that the draft uh, uh generated a lot of discussion on the on the mailing list this means that there is uh, there is interest there is also uh rather support i would say since uh, uh most of the comments were uh, were positive uh i didn't see any next step in, in your uh, uh in your presentation but i guess uh, you you want the draft to become a working group document uh, sooner mm -hmm. or later is assumption correct that, that's correct and i have good input requirements and comments on the email list will be which will be worked in an updated version mainly from from the air train guys and from ericsson yeah okay uh i think uh, this is it uh, thank you very much uh, stefan uh, for uh, for the presentation thanks everyone uh, for uh, uh, being so fast uh, and uh, helping us uh, closing the the meeting almost in time and uh, see you in uh, London. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.